Hey guys, welcome to this week's video. So slightly different setup. I will explain who this lovely lady is in just a moment. But we are basically going to be doing three collaborative interviews um, through October, November and December. We're going to be sharing our insights and strategies into health, um, diets, exercise, movement, all those kind of things that we both talk about. So I'm going to let Carrie introduce herself. And then we're going to get started because I want to give you, I want to ask her a few questions and really introduce her to you. So, Hello, everybody. I'm very excited to be here with Melanie today. My name is Carrie Headley, and um, I am the CEO of Head in the Game Fitness. Um, my goals with what I do in my coaching and my business are very similar to what Melanie practices, and it's teaching women more than just um, weight loss and physical changes. It's really about dialing into your life and who you are and what makes you feel good and just feeling better, feeling healthy. So that's that's me. Hello. So Carrie and I met through um, a business mentorship program, which, so we've only actually known each other, well, known each other exists since January. Um, and you reached out to me, I think, and said we have similar background stories. I think we're probably maybe the only ones out of the 50 women who come from that kind of background of being overweight and struggling for a very, very long time with successful weight loss or health and making those changes. And so you reached out to me because so we could kind of discuss. And since then we've been in touch probably every week. Um, the reason I'm introducing you to my email list um, and posting this on my website is because, as I said, we are going to be doing three collaborative interviews um, through October, November and December. They're going to be live. We're going to be sharing more details closer to the time, but we wanted to introduce each other to our kind of our email list. And um, I wanted to introduce you on social media with my page and my business because Whilst we have um, a similar background, we also have very similar outlooks on how we coach our clients and the transformations and what we also don't like in the industry. Um, and we have talked about different things. And, and I, one of the things I noticed is that when you write and you record, you I never hear you talk about vanity goals. I never hear you talk about weight loss or fat loss. It's only ever about health. And I think it was yesterday, um, you did a video where you talked about the notion of skinny um, and trying to be a certain size or trying to fit into a certain, um, fit into a certain idea of what we think perfection is or what we think we should look like. So I wanted to ask you why you choose to never mention weight loss or fat loss and why you only ever talk about health? Um, well, I think it has to do with just, you know, experience throughout my entire life. As you already touched on, I was heavy as a kid. Um, in one of my videos last week, I showed pictures as far back as fourth grade. So I think I would have been nine or 10 at that point. And I was very overweight. I carried this feeling with me for years into my 20s and 30s that I was not kind of acceptable or attractive because of how I looked. Um, my body type just does not fit, nor has it ever, what mainstream shows as women being attractive. I'm not tall. I'm not 5'7", five, 5'8". Five, I'm about 5'4". I am not small and petite. My muscles are big. Um, my leg muscles in particular, I have big leg muscles. Like I would have been, had speed skating been available in my high school, that would have been my sport. I have really <laughs> big thigh muscles. I just do. I'm built that way. Um, and, and you mentioned this when we just talked too, like um, boots, wearing knee high boots. I cannot find them, you know, 50, 60 pounds, weighing 50, 60 pounds less, they still don't fit me. Um, 
So losing weight does not necessarily equal the body shape and type that mainstream shows us. So I guess I, I'm over that conversation because um, you might lose weight, you will be successful on that path, but you may not still end up feeling good about who you are in yourself because you just aren't like what we're projected to look like. And I don't mean that as a slam, it's just the reality, we're all different. But women in particular are only shown we're supposed to be one way. So the more that we talk about weight and the size of our bodies, the more we kind of feed into that. And I just, I don't want to talk about it anymore. Um, the other reason is I think that we need to start talking in terms of health, how we feel, how the things that we do are helping us in our daily life, how they help us manage the stress of daily life. And losing weight doesn't dial into that. Um, you may be doing all the right things, the right things. You may be changing how you eat. You may be moving more and you may not see a change on the scale. There are other things, probably factors that play in your life, um, particularly stress, some hormonal responses. So if your end goal is only the weight change, you're never going to get to the heart of what some of these other things are that are affecting you. It's health and health has a lot to do with your mindset and that you cannot tie to what your weight is. So that's why I focus on that health, health, health. Thank you. I'm glad you mentioned mindset because mindset is not sexy. It's one of the, I, um, I like talk about it and I often wonder whether I've shared how for me just a few years ago, the word, even the word mindset probably wasn't even in my vocabulary. It just, it never occurred to me because I was still very much a calories person. Um, and I think you and I have both said this, that, you know, even if the diets haven't worked, you've still picked something up from them. You've still probably picked up some kind of habit that works for you. And that's why you're still doing it. And the mindset change it's tough it's really really difficult and as i said it's not sexy it's it requires some you know some tears some truthful conversations with yourself and maybe loved ones and the yeah. idea of of putting everything you have into the scale it's exhausting it's it's mm -hmm. really hard work so what i wanted to know from you is when did you start to change from a calorie or a scale based approach to how you now live, to how you now eat and move and, and your lifestyle now? Um, that's actually fairly recent. When I was in, I call it weight loss mode, what I did beginning in 2010, um, I was still counting calories because I didn't know anything different. That's all that had been ever presented to me outside of when I tried Weight Watchers. And that was checking off, at least at the time I was doing it, checking off food portions or portions of food in little boxes. And you had to meet so many proteins, so many vegetables, so many fruit, so many fat. And I had tried that numerous times and it did not um, work for me at all. So I knew I wasn't going to record what I ate in that fashion. So I went back to calories. That's what I knew. Um, and I also had some friends along the way who we really helped each other. And then we got into my fitness pal and I hated it. I hated every moment of writing in there. I always did it by pen and paper when it was by myself, but I hated my fitness pal. I hated the idea of my friends seeing what I ate, I still had this very um, conflicted view about the food that I ate, meaning oh, I don't want anybody to see that I had chocolate or beer or that I had three pieces of pizza. Like I didn't want to tell anybody that because they still felt it was bad. Um, so that kind of started my, I just, I know I don't want a calorie count. And I also 
preach a lot, and I believed this from the very get-go in 2010, what I do has to be something that I'm willing to do far into the foreseeable future. I don't want to say forever because as you change and evolve, what you believe and what you do is going to change, and that's the nature of it. But I couldn't see myself journaling forever. I, I don't want to do that or calorie counting. I shouldn't say journaling because journaling is something different. I didn't want to calorie count forever. Um, so I kind of gave that up probably at least a couple of years ago. But this year, I'm really dialing more into how I feel and making the connections with um, fullness and satisfaction and how it ties to sleep, actually. Um, I have a lot of issues with feeling rested and fatigue, and that's what I'm trying to dial into now. So um, it's relatively new for me. It the calorie counting helped me for a while, but I never looked at it as punitive per se, or I guess I didn't always have, like I had to be within a certain calorie count. Um, it was a way for me to figure out what I was eating. Um, you didn't so have did a you? golden number? I didn't because I didn't know what it was. Okay. Um, when I first started tracking, when I was losing weight, I would write down, I had a a calculator on site that I would go and type in my food and it would report back what the calorie was and I would write it out all longhand. So I'd journal and I'd write down all those calories until about midday. But at that time I was still eating like a lot of casserole based stuff and I had no idea how to count condensed soup and pasta and chicken and um, vegetables in there and a mix of things. I didn't know how to count it. So I would reach about the 13 or 1400 calorie range for the day. And I figured, well, if I had a 400 calorie dinner, which I thought was reasonable, was about right. And I had no idea. I don't know why I thought 1700 to 1900 calories was okay. I just knew that what I was eating up to that point was really good whole food choices. And so I didn't kind of sweat that after that evening meal and it was working so I kept doing it no one told me I should eat a particular number of calories I didn't know what I was doing it was kind of this weird kismet of things that by nature of me kind of hanging on to some of my old stuff and trying something new that it by golly was having the result I needed so that's really interesting because I know that my number was always 1500 and I don't even know where I got that from, but it was, it was always 1500, even up until 2013, it was 1500 calories. And of course I would try and stay below that. And I think it was 1500 just because the math was easy, <laughs> but it was always 1500. And it was only probably in the last three years where I realized that the linear approach of 1500 calories or 1200 calories or a thousand calories or whatever, or 1900 calories, whatever it is, the linear process is not going to give you the results that you maybe want. Um, yes. And you touched on sleep and stress. And I talk about that a lot because last year for me, I was so, I, it was a lot of self created stress, but I was so stressed out. I wasn't sleeping not only because I had a toddler, but because I was, taking pre-workouts and then trying to go to the gym and I was just causing myself so many problems. Now I set myself up a routine because it was really important for me to sleep, which it sounds like it's, it's something you're working on. It's really, really important. Yeah. And I sleep probably 99% of the time I sleep solidly eight hours and I feel good for that. And it was taking care of myself that made that difference. And you mentioned journaling because <laughs> I'm an avid journaler and, and it, it, it's interesting because I tracked calories, like you said, and I, and I use my fitness pal and I, I didn't hate my fitness pal. I became very obsessed with it. I ended up hating it. Um, and now I journal, but what you touched on was how about fullness and I journal now about 
how I feel when I wake up, how I feel after I eat, how I felt after that workout, you know, if I'm having cravings, where do they possibly come from? Those kind of things. So yep. I, I would agree. Do I see myself doing it forever? I don't know, but it's, it's not, it's not what it was. And I think you made a very, you, you made a good point that whatever you do, even if you can see yourself doing it long term, it may adapt and don't feel guilty or bad about the fact that things change because life changes. Yep. And so that kind of stuff all rolls into one. I wanted to, so prior to 2010, by the sounds of it, did you ever feel like you were missing out on anything because of your weight or your health? Yes. Prior to 2010, um, I couldn't look forward to events of any sort where you were meant to go and enjoy yourself. And, um, it was a day that you might dress up and be a little fancier. It was like total angst and upset and stress because I would want to have something new and the shopping experience was just, that was the, that was the lead up. That was just a horrible, um, is so awful when you have clothes that appeal to you and you like the colors and you like the cut or the design or the style and they're not either not in your size or they just don't lay right. They pinch, they bind, they gap in places they're not meant to. Um, it was a horrible experience. I was usually left with like two or three options in my size that were available. They were never colors I enjoyed, never really styles that I enjoyed, but they fit and they were acceptable and they didn't make me look even larger than I was. So that was usually like my first disappointment and upset with having to go to this event. Then it was the day of actually, you know, trying to feel comfortable in my skin and feel good and look forward to it. And I didn't because I never liked how I looked. Um, we didn't do Christmas parties with my husband. I would avoid those at all costs. I really didn't look forward to family functions like you should. You should be there and joyful and be relishing in whosoever event it is. And the fact that you're with family and friends and enjoying the day. And that was not what I could focus on. So you're hearing me talk about um, that it's my weight. The truth of the matter is it's mindset. Okay. Um, you will lose weight. You will change your health and clothes are still not going to fit you. It is the truth of it. Um, all of us in all different sizes, including my very, very tiny petite friends, clothes, just don't fit off the rack and we all have different body types and shapes. And guess what? Even if you weigh 130 pounds and you are a size two, you still have to try on 20 pairs of jeans to get the ones that fit you well and flatter you. So it's not all about the physical pieces of your body. It's about your mindset and how you feel and how you go into those moments in life. I didn't get that then, I do now, but most certainly I felt like my weight was a hindrance because I did not feel comfortable. Yeah. So. No, I, 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 I totally know what you mean by that because I guess for me, one of the biggest things when I did get to go away was I remember being able to go into a store and try on clothes and things that I had always imagined wearing. Um, but yet now I can buy clothes and I can go to the same store and I know that those things will fit me. And that's just as comforting to be able to go and know that I can wear something. I think from a very young age, I remember having to go to plus size stores, um, not being able to buy normal clothes or go to normal shops and, trousers being cut too long and funnily enough they're still cut too long because I've not grown <laughs> I'm yep. still short and so 
that what you said about the fact that even people who are a size two are still going to have to find something that fits. That was really, really good because just being slim doesn't mean or slimmer or a certain size does not mean that you never have an issue picking out clothes. I have noticed that just with my son, he's two and a half and clothes, every shop that sell children's clothes are cut differently, even at that young age. So yeah, it's not, it's not all the same. Things are cut differently, but finding what you actually like is, is huge. And being able to wear things that you feel comfortable in is so important. Yeah. Can I add one thing? Mm. Um, I did a, a blog post on this about how I really don't like summer. And I did not for years. I'm coming away from that to a certain degree. But you'll find, too, as you kind of continue on your own path with this, that you've got, like, stuff buried deep that you don't realize is there until you start picking away at things little by little. So back to my disliking summer forever. I hated summer. I didn't like wearing shorts. Um, one, nothing ever fit me because I was heavy as a child. So the sizes available and how they were meant to fit little girls never fit me. Swimsuits were just beyond unimaginable to me at a young age even, I was very aware that my body did not look like the girls who were around me. I was much bigger and it was a source of embarrassment for me. Why and how that came to be, I'm not sure because my friends didn't say those things to me, nor did my parents. So I have received some messaging somewhere and I still don't really know what that is, but I, I didn't want to be in a swimsuit. Fast forward to my um, adult years. I lived in capris forever and a day. Word, I wore capris. You know, I and it makes me really sad and disappointed in myself to look back and think that I felt so poorly about myself and my body and my perception by others that I stifled my body and sat in discomfort because I thought somebody would be like, well, she should not be wearing shorts. I mean, yeah, this weight... And what we view that it means really plays on your mental choices and how you view things. So, yeah, it, it definitely affected what I did. Yeah, I, I agree with you as well. And summer has always been an issue for me as well. And, again, I don't know where it comes from, but it was – well, for me, it was the thigh chafe. But shorts yeah. and dresses and skirts. And, and, and the thing is, when I lost – a lot of weight I did wear shorts but I certainly didn't have skinny legs um I don't remember having the same problems but I thought about this recently because I just literally only have jeans or yoga pants and that's by choice but it wasn't anything to do with the summer or anything like that and I was walking around I was really hot and I said to my husband I'm really hot he said you should buy some shorts and my instant reaction was nobody wants to see that and I said it and he was shocked and I was like where did that come from? Because that's not like me. It's not like me to say something like that. And I actually started to observe recently. Um, last weekend we had a bank holiday here and it was very, very hot. And I, I was observing other women who looked amazing, had shorts on. And I thought to myself, you know, what's interesting here is that there are 25 million different types of shorts. And it's because I'm still thinking that my shorts have to be like denim cutoffs, like something from, um, Dukes of Hazard. when they don't have to be like that, they can be, you know, they can be a little bit longer. Um, and that, that was really interesting. I thought, well, summer's almost finished now, but next year I'll think about that. But yeah, shorts were a huge thing for me as well. Yes. Yeah. And it, and it sticks. I mean, we have this totally emotional and visceral reaction when like nobody's, nobody's looking or the people that would or say a comment. Wow. Yeah. They are not the type of people we should be giving our time to anyways. No. But it took me a long time to get to the point of seeing that. It really did. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's, yeah. And that's the thing. Cause I think we, we create a lot of stuff in our heads. We create a lot of situations and stories and things that don't ever actually happen. And exactly. I think, and I always say we are so much harder on ourselves than we would ever be on anybody else. And mm -hmm. we, disregard ourselves way before anybody else would ever do that so yeah, yeah. <laughs> so 
I have recently been sharing um, three dieting tips that I still do now, the things I still use even after all this time, things I picked up when I dieted, but I now made them work for my lifestyle. Do you have, <clears throat> excuse me, do you have anything that you back? still do now all right. that you did so way back at the beginning? So dieting rules, what have I you. carried is actually something that works in my life. Um, I think it's one that I try to employ when I am dialed in to the fact that I'm not hungry. It's get busy with something else. Um, take some time and get out of the kitchen and, you know, organize a drawer, go, um, outside, take a quick walk, um, you know, clean the toilets. I, I don't know, something to give you 10 minutes pause. Um, and I find I only need that really when I'm probably dealing with something I don't want to, meaning I'm in a state of anxiety of some sort and I'm feeling like, oh, I just want to eat something. I just want to eat something. I've learned enough now that that's my cue that I'm not hungry per se, because if I don't know what I want to eat, I'm not actually hungry. I'm trying to do something else, you know, boredom or I'm upset, you know, something's working at me. And usually when I recognize that now, it's just get busy and use distraction is one yeah. um, that I can think of that was talked about as a way to, you know, get you from eating. I remember that one. Well, yeah. 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 I would say distraction for me is, um, you know, I remember you talking about this too. Water is huge. Um, I don't have a hard and fast rule for like how much I drink per day, but I keep a sipper by me most of the time and water makes a difference. Yeah, it totally does. Um, it does for me, help me feel fuller and more satisfied. I feel better. Um, as you'd expect, I used to have a ton of problems with headaches. And I know now that that is due to dehydration and not taking in enough water because the days when I am not keeping that water near me or I am out longer than I anticipated and I didn't have it with me, not like you can't buy bottled water, but it just so happens the day doesn't work out. More often than not, I'm ending up with some sort of headache, if not that night. The next morning I wake up and I just feel, you know, like, like on those cartoon, like alum. Is that what they would have? Like on Bugs Bunny or whatever? Like your face is just oh, okay. dried up. And <laughs> yes, that's how I feel in the morning. So water <clears throat> and distraction. Okay. Yeah. Those are my carryovers. Cool. Yeah. I, I also was recently talking about water and somebody said to me that she used to carry this bottle of water around with her like a lifeline when she was doing like restrictive diets because it's always one of those things it's like you must drink so many liters of water a day and I find that really funny because I did it as well now I only drink water and I do you know I will always have water around me like you said but it's not whilst I know the benefit it's not an obsession it's not like like you said some days you go out and you're like oh dang I didn't take my war and and you're aware of it um but it's not so much of a it's not a stress. It's not right. because, yeah, I, I always say that drink as much as you can, but don't make it stressful. Cause if you start counting it and it becomes a problem, then that's just going to, you're not going to stick to it. Yep. Exactly. So I want to talk to you about a recent blog that you wrote. Okay. When do you know where this is going? Um, about <laughs> what it means to be a coach, because for those of you who are on my email list and watching this video and are in the UK, you know that we have very, very few health or fitness MLMs. So um, I think it's multi-level marketing or something. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, um, so for example, if you're in the UK, things like Avon um, or what was Pampered Chef. Now we don't have that anymore. But those kind of things. Um, and in the US, you do have a very, very popular one cool is it beach body is the actual thing and then all the other bits mm -hmm. kind of stem from that 
So yep. Beach Body is an uh, is an MLM, and you have Beach Body coaches. Yes. And you recently wrote a blog about what it means to be a coach and you were discussing the notion of why you became a coach. And I'm really interested for you to tell us why you decided, when you decided to become a coach, why you decided to do that, kind of what you, how you, why and how you want to help more women. But also tell us a little bit, for those of us who don't know, a little bit about Beachbody and why it's, why it's kind of so frustrating. And let me just start by saying, I totally agree with you on that one as well. (laughs) All right. Um, Yeah, I can feel myself getting uptight to answer this. Not because I don't, I'm I'm going to be very honest with you, but I preface this with, it's a hotly debated thing. I don't know about in the UK, but here in the US, I'm in, Um, I think they're largely U.S. forums um, for trainers and personal trainers, health coaches. um, And there's a few Facebook pages that I follow. And when Beachbody in particular, there are other companies too, but when Beachbody in particular comes up, it is like a shitstorm of comments. And they're all visceral. You either are staunchly in the camp that I am, and I will say I am staunchly there, which is I don't advocate for these products, and I don't like that the term coach is applied to the people who can sell the products, with a caveat, which I'll get to in a moment. Then there's the other camp of people who are, if it helps people, if what I'm doing is getting them on the right track and they're making the decision about what they want to follow, then there's no harm in it. Um, So yeah, very, very hotly contested. So again, like I can feel myself, I am talking about a really controversial thing here. So I'm like, Um, so I became a coach. Uh, Through all my own changes, the thing that became very obvious to me is there is not one right answer. And for years, I thought there was. Like, if someone who's been skinny could just tell me what to do, I won't be fat anymore. Just just tell me what to do. I can follow the rules. Like, tell me what to eat. Tell me when to eat. Tell me how to exercise. Give it to me. Come on, cough up the secret. What do you do? That is honestly how I felt. I felt like I did not know I was missing something. How was it that I was remaining fat? I just, I couldn't equate in my mind. So as I went through my own changes and decided that I was going to figure out how to eat pizza and ice cream and still do this thing called life and be healthy and lose some weight, I discovered that the other women who I began to meet were also doing it in their own way. Um, There were some women that did not eat gluten. There were some who were very adamant that you needed to eat vegan. Um, there was some who avoided dairy. There was some who ate five to six small meals a day and insisted that was the way to go. That's where I started. I don't do that anymore. Um, there was women that did three squares. There was people that did paleo. Everybody was changing and getting healthier. Okay. So as I kind of learned that, and I learned also how much your mind plays into that. I just, I felt like it was a revelation for years. I thought there was rules and certain ways to be. And when I discovered it's okay. So yeah, once I I realized that it's internal and focusing on you and what works for you uniquely yourself, I wanted other women to know that too. Um, so for me, coaching is, a culmination of a lot of things. It's my personal experience, yeah, but I also have taken a lot of classes to learn how to program workouts and um, proper movement for the body, proper variations of exercise, um, listening and interviewing clients and hearing what they're saying back to you. Um, learning about habit formation and mindset all those things. Um, It's important to me that people who are working in the health field have some sort of similar basis and foundation. That's not to say that 
because someone is certified or not, or has taken certain classes or not, that they are better and more suited than someone else. But it ensures that at least someone has some background and some place other than money to be talking about what they're doing. Um, here in the States, you do not have to hold any sort of um, American Council on Exercise, which I'm certified through. There's NASM, which I think is like National Association of Sports Medicine, something like that. There's various ones. Um, same thing with health coaching. ACE, who I just said I'm certified through, they offer many different um, health coaching certifications. Uh, there's Precision Nutrition, which I know you know of. Mm -hmm. um, so they are out there and there's people who are striving to build some education foundation in what they do, but it's not required. Now back to Beachbody, what they title the people who are selling stuff within that MLM is an independent Beachbody coach. Now that could be anybody. There's a number of people who I know who carry um, industry certifications and also are an independent Beachbody coach and they are advocating for the workouts that Beachbody sells as well as Shakeology, which is a meal replacement product amongst other stuff that I think they also sell. And also within that, there are a number of people who do not have any sort of industry cert or background other than their personal experience, which does count to a certain degree, but they're dispensing something that really gets into nutrition and how you eat um, and how you move when they don't have background. Um, I'll give you a very specific example. Um, and that is like my mom, my mom who is going to be 76 October 1st, she has been approached by a couple of these MLMs to buy into their products and their programs and losing weight. Um, she also is on blood thinners. And if you know anything about that, you're supposed to be very specific about your vitamin K intake because it messes with the effectiveness of the blood thinners. Um, I'd be really curious to know if anybody who's dispensing these products is asking her about her medications. In the instances where she has been asked, I know that to not be the case. So you have people who don't have nutritional background, don't know to ask, you know, trainers be contraindicated things like medications, like um, exercises. And it's it's really scary to me. Yeah, I don't think that it's wise that you don't have to have a basic education to be able to sell this stuff, which I'm assuming it must be the same over there too. Um, a lot of these supplements aren't, they're not monitored. They're not FDA monitored. So there can be all sorts of claims in whatever put on the packaging and, mm. <clears throat> you know, who knows if it's accurate yeah. or not. So... Yeah, that's my spiel. I really have a visceral reaction to it. The other thing I brought up in my blog, and I'll finish with this, is there's a number of people who I know that are certified personal trainers. They do group fitness. Um, and I've seen some dietitians too, although I don't know them personally. I know that's their background just by virtue of seeing what they do online and what else they talk about. Those folks that are selling, in particular, some of the beach body stuff, it's secondary. They don't title themselves independent beach body coach. And it is not the bulk of what they talk about. It is a piece in a plug-in to an overall message. It is not the message. It would seem to me most of the folks that I've seen that sell this stuff and don't have the fitness background too, that is their message. Drink this, buy these programs, and there's not a whole lot of education and help and actual coaching on how to help people change their habits. So, yeah. I mean, because even though we don't have it, I know of it, I've seen it, 
I get very confused because there seems to be so many various elements of it. But I definitely, my impression of it, and this is personally my impression, is that I see it's it's playing into the quick fix. It plays into the, I have a secret, which you don't have. Come and buy my secret potions and powders and workout videos and you will get results. You will get results, of course, but you won't learn yes. what you and I talk about and it won't necessarily serve you long term. And I posed this question to Carrie before we got started. I was inspired by your blog and I and I, I, I haven't, I, I'm, by the time we record this video and I put it up, I may well have already posted this, but I asked the question if whether it's Shakeology or you're in the UK and it's the Cambridge diet or lighter life, if you follow a very specific meal replacement plan, if you wake up tomorrow and they no longer exist, what are you going to do? Because if you can no longer buy that shake, that bar, that program, and you suddenly have to figure it out all by yourself, it will be tough. It will be tough because we both know it's tough. And what you what you think you are getting from these products, you can get from real food. I had somebody challenge me this on um, with sorry, challenge me with this about Arbon. Is that how you pronounce it? Mm-hmm. Yeah. I the gym I used to go to had an advertisement in the ladies' gym for this meal stuff, and I wrote a post about it. I took a photo and I posted and said, "I don't like this. This is why." And she said to me, "It's helped me with my arthritis, and it's helped me with this, that, and the other." And I said, "Okay, as you said, I said that's really good that you found something that works for you, but I wonder what you could do with real food because here in the UK things are, I think, are slightly different." Um, we don't have the number of, uh, we have different people you can get your certifications through, but we don't have the number that you have. And we then have almost like a union. We have, uh, we have reps, which is the register of exercise professionals who we, um, can basically go to with problems and we get our insurance through. Um, and I am actually in the midst of studying for my exercise referral qualification, which is a high risk um, clients. So it's for people who are suffering with obesity, hypertension, uh, diabetes, arthritis, osteoporosis, stress, anxiety, depression, and back pain. Um, because here, because we have the NHS, we can, I would then be able to work with a local care trust. Um, and they would refer clients to me who have those issues. You are not in the UK. You are not supposed to work with clients who are obese diabetic, high blood pressure. You're not supposed to work with any of those clients who are considered high risk if you don't have that qualification. Oh, and interesting. It's, it, and I know there are probably people that do because I think, the especially with obesity, I wonder whether there's kind of a, a level of, well, what does that mean? Um, but I know specifically we have very certain rules. If you go to a gym here and you are you have high blood pressure or you are diabetic or you're on certain medication you're referred straight back to your gp and you have to get clearance or you then have to be sent to see an exercise referral trainer so it is slightly different but i have no doubt that there are people who coach and maybe ignore the rules um but it's to me my opinion of, sh of the beach body stuff is that you're right. I know that we actually, in the group that we're in, there is one person in particular who I know is very successful and she does not, she talks about her Shakeology stuff, but she doesn't make that her number one thing. That's not who she is. That's just a sideline of it. Um, but yeah, I, I do wonder, I think to myself, whilst we buy into that, it's just buying into quick fixes. And you and I have both bonded over recently how frustrating it is that these people have such a huge following and you said to me it's like 120 dollars for a packet of protein powder or shakeology powder which is yeah that's like a week for me that's like a week's worth of groceries yep. yeah and it'd be a hell of a lot more satisfying to have steak and salad than it would be to have protein shakes every day so yes. yeah it's thank you water <laughs> <laughs> she knew <laughs> i needed it so well. <laughs> but yeah so yeah, it's, it's, oh, yeah, I would agree. I just don't have to see it as much as you do. 
Yes. Yeah, you're exactly right. And I've had clients ask me, well, what do you think about this? And I, I, it's really hard for me to um, be objective about it because I do have a visceral reaction to it and I know that I do, but you just hit on exactly what I talk about, which is, is a slippery slope. Are you doing it? Like, what's your reason to want to do it? Is it simply because it takes you two minutes in the morning to whip this breakfast up that is going to cover most of the bases for you? And it would be better than if you had a bagel loaded with nasty cream cheese at the office. Okay, that that I'll, I can buy into to a certain degree. But if you're doing it because you think that's where all your nutrition is, that's not accurate. Mm. Um, and if you're doing it because there's an element of weight loss to it, that's not going to help you either. It, it might get the end result in that there may be a change in your weight, but it's not teaching you anything. It's not teaching you how to put food in your body that satisfies and sustains um, it's not teaching you to kind of learn the ebb and flow of your life because you will have them. So yes, that is my big thing also is there's a whole learning element that is missing from the equation of all that stuff. You have to take time. I know it sounds very unsexy and very like drudgerous and hard work and I don't mean for it to because my process has been a lot of hard work, but it hasn't sucked. I don't feel like it was pressure laden and gross to do every day. But the way, why I am where I'm at now is because it had to be hard work. You had to learn. And stuff like that does not teach you. It doesn't help you and empower you that you can trust. You know what you need to do for you. It just doesn't. I, I agree. They'll tell you it does, but no, I agree. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Mm -mm. Okay. okay. So I just wanted to finish this video the way I finish my videos now. It's become a thing about, can you tell me, and I'm going to answer mine as well, but can you tell me what you learned this week? It's been this week and, and several things like this along the way, which is, um, it's okay to say your opinion and how you feel. And it's okay to just be exactly who you are with the thoughts and the opinions that you have. Um, we've talked about the live video that I did just yesterday. And I talked about how I'm so very tired of the weight loss conversation and making women skinny and how I want to talk about something different. Um, it's been, it was scary for me to do that because it makes me swim against the current in my message. And that's scary because there's a shift coming with what's going on in health and fitness, particularly around women right now. There's a shift and it's building momentum, but it's not out in the mainstream just yet. And so it's scary to abandon that piece of messaging, especially with what I am trying to achieve with coaching. But it was so freeing and it felt so good to just stop dancing around it and say, I don't, I don't want to preach weight loss anymore. It's of changing your health and changing your life, but it's not, it's not the nugget that's going to change your life, how much you weigh. So yeah, my, what I learned this week is go and feel good about who you are. Let the chips fall because people will fill in and stand behind you and you'll be amazed at the response you get when you are just who you are. It feels good. Yeah, totally. And this Facebook live session that you mentioned, I came home last night. I'd been on a date night. I had a couple of glasses of wine, but I watched it and I was laying in bed watching it. And my husband was like, Oh, this is really good. I was like, it's awesome. Go Gary. <laughs> it was so obvious that you were really, really fired up and it didn't show that you were scared to talk about it at all. It was, it was very authentic and it was, 
it is very scary when, like you said, I think I feel exactly the same. What we talk about is not mainstream. That's a good and a bad thing. Um, it means that we get to create what we are doing and we get to help other women see this different way, this different perspective. But when it's not mainstream, it's a struggle. It's, it's, it's not, as you said, it's not deemed to be sexy and trying to teach women that imperfection is sexy and that the Fitzbo post and skinny is not the only way it, it takes time. There are women, plenty of women though, who are there. They just haven't found us yet and we haven't found them. And, um, it's, it's really difficult, but yeah, that Facebook live session <laughs> was <you>. awesome. <laughs> it was very um, and also to, with regards to what you're talking about is the moment you are currently, no, is it closed? H3? Uh, yeah, it's closed. Tom- so tomorrow at closed. midnight, Sunday at midnight closes. Tomorrow, tomorrow at midnight, Sunday at midnight. Okay, so that closes tomorrow. So you're currently, and H3 is hone, see now I'm doing this. Hone your healthy habits. That's what I was thinking. Okay. And it's basically about implementation and habits and it's it's about basically the stuff that you don't learn from those quick fixes right right exactly yeah so it's i know that that's a huge thing for you and it's your message is about what you have learned and how you implement it going forward um and yeah it's it's really really amazing and i've obviously watched you talking about this over the last week and it's yeah it's 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 inspiring it's inspiring for me as well so it's i'm glad i get to be a part of it too yes this has been good for both of us i think yeah okay so what i learned this week and it was actually kind of because i don't ever use the word grain but you use that word quite a lot and i realized i was talking about it and i was saying earlier this week i picked a very quick breakfast um and i picked oatmeal which is not normal for me nor is it normal for the summer and i just wouldn't normally pick it and i had it and I talked about how it wasn't perfect because I'm currently going through launching F Perfect Challenge, but I was craving all day long after having that breakfast because I was hungry two hours later. I ate my lunch like there was no more food was ever going to exist. And then I just had cravings all day and all night. And I didn't give in to those cravings. I made the choice to just eat what I needed to eat and just basically go to bed because I was so fed up with feeling that way. But what I realized and what I learned this week was that a grain or a carbohydrate based breakfast really isn't the thing for me. And yeah. we both talk about figuring out what works for you. And it was, it wasn't necessarily a new revelation, but it reaffirmed what I already knew. Um, but I just haven't had it in so long that I'd kind of forgotten how it was, how I feel. So that was what I learned this week. So yes. So I'm going to finish up this video now, but guys, okay. um, as I said, Carrie and I are going to be doing, three live interviews October, November, December we will share with our email list and everything, the dates and things like that once we have a little bit more information but we basically wanted to get together and do this so that we could provide you guys with as much strategy and insight into what we talk about because we, whilst we both talk about similar things, I talk fat loss, you talk health, it is I do talk about health as well <laughs> but it's we talk about it in different ways so we wanted to share that with you um, so we will be giving you more information once we have that. Um, but we wanted to do this first and give you a little bit of insight about the other person. Um, I don't know whether you're going to give me yours so I can share that with my guys. I don't know, but yeah, you will be seeing this, uh, week commencing 12th of September. So the F perfect challenge will almost be finished and we will be going through all that. But yeah, thank you for doing this with me and thank you for sharing the difficult stuff and talking about your blog and I know that it was tough to talk about beach body and stuff but thank you for doing that because I think absolutely. more people need to hear it so yeah absolutely anytime I'm very much looking forward to our our blab sessions throughout the fall because I think women need to hear something different the message has got to change and while we're both talking about losing weight, there's a whole lot more to it than just that change in in body mass. There's so much more, and I'm glad that we're on the same page and we can educate and make it appealing because it is. It's really freeing 
to start to shed some of that junk that's tied to your body weight and your whole physical self. Because, man, when you can step away from that, it feels fabulous. It just does. It really feels good. It does. It it feels amazing to not have to spend every year thinking about how many pounds you're going to lose and starting again and and it being this constant repetition. But then what comes with that is the the negative feelings and the negative thoughts, not having to do that. It's it's huge. Exactly. All right. Great. Okay. So thank you guys. And we will see you again soon.